Hello and welcome to Indus News with me, Osman Lone. Now, after nine months of tireless work, exhaustive diplomacy and countering New Delhi's stumbling blocks, Pakistan has launched its peace initiative, the Qatarpur Corridor. In a formal ceremony at the Zero Line in Narawal, the final agreement was signed today between Pakistan and India. More in this report. Darbar Sahib Kartarpur is located 4.5 kilometers from Pakistan-India border in district Narawal, Pakistan. It is one of the holiest places for Sikhism followers around the world. To facilitate a shorter route for the pilgrims, Islamabad incepted the Kartarpur corridor and sent the proposal to India last year. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan held the groundbreaking of the project in November 2018. Today, Pakistan's Foreign Ministry spokesman Mohammad Faisal and Indian Joint Secretary of Home Ministry SCL Das inked the agreement. Speaking after the signing ceremony, Faisal said Prime Minister Imran Khan had fulfilled his promise and completed the corridor in a year. The signing of the agreement, despite challenges, indicates the resolve of the Prime Minister to fulfill his commitment in line with Islamic principles for respect of all religions and government's policy. Uh, on promoting interfaith harmony. Faisal said the agreement is a historic achievement by Pakistan in its pursuit of regional peace and stability. The uh, agreement was signed by Mr. Das, uh, who is the Joint Secretary Home Affairs uh, from India on behalf of India and I signed it on behalf of Pakistan. The agreement will facilitate pilgrims to visit Gurdwara uh, uh, Qatarpur Sahib seven days a week. Ji. Pakistan is all set to open the shrine before 550th birth anniversary celebration of Baba Guru Nanak on November the 12th. New Delhi's curfew in the occupied valley is having a devastating impact on local people's mental health. The latest report by international journalists has exposed the worsening state of affairs in occupied Kashmir. Journalists have conducted multiple interviews of both local doctors and civilians. The report said the number of patients suffering from stress and anxiety has risen drastically over the past 80 days. It said the trauma of living in fear of the Indian Army's abductions, torture and arrests is the main cause. It added that over 170 patients visit clinics daily. The report said the actual number of mental health patients is much higher as most cannot reach hospitals due to the clampdown. New Delhi's curfew and communications blackout in the occupied territory has entered its 81st day. The people and political parties of occupied Kashmir have completely boycotted the council elections. The ruling Bharatiya Janata Party is the only major party contesting. International watchdogs and media say the polls have zero credibility due to local rejection and non-participation. Locals said this is more like completing a formality as it's essentially an artificial exercise. In 2018, 60% of 21,000 villages council seats remained vacant due to the boycott. In India, the Supreme Court has asked the centre to review curbs it has imposed in occupied Kashmir in the name of national interest. A three-judge bunch was hearing a batch of petitions challenging curbs in the state following the scrapping of its special status. It asked the Modi administration how long it intends to continue with restrictions in Jammu and Kashmir. Emphasizing that the blackout has been in place for over two months, it called on the centre to come clear on the issue. The top court posted the matter for hearing on the 5th of November. Civil society members have slammed India over human rights abuses during the U.S. Congressional hearing on occupied Kashmir. The Congressional body's hearing was held earlier this week to highlight the humanitarian crisis in the valley. University of Westminster professor Natasha Kaul said India has broken every single principle of democracy in the valley. Angana Chaturji from the University of California said the human rights abuses may lead to an armed uprising. Amnesty International official Francisco Ben Cosme said his organization has documented a clear pattern of human rights violations in the valley. Now, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan says two million refugees will return to northern Syria after the establishment of a safe zone. 
He was speaking in Ankara and said Turkey will implement its own plans if Kurdish fighters don't withdraw from the area under the ceasefire deal with Russia. Meanwhile, Turkey's defense ministry says five Turkish soldiers were wounded in an attack by Kurdish fighters in the border town of Ras Al Ain. It said the attack was conducted using drones and mortars. But the Kurdish fighters accused Ankara of violating the truce by launching an offensive on three villages in northeast Syria. Well, the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces have assured Russia they'll keep their end of the ceasefire deal. Talking to Russia's Defense Minister Sergei Shogu, SDF head Mazlum Abdi thanked Moscow for saving his people. Shogu said he told the SDF head to implement the Russian-Turkish-Syria deal from their side. The Russian military police started deploying on Syria's northeast border on Wednesday. Under the deal signed in Sochi on Tuesday, Turkey will remain fully deployed in an Arab-majority area. It also requires Kurdish forces to pull back to a line 30 kilometers from the entire border, forcing them to surrender some of their main towns. Russia and Turkey will then start joint patrols in two zones along the border. Saudi Arabia's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Adil Al-Jubeir, says maximum pressure is the only way to bring Iran to the negotiating table. He was speaking in Paris ahead of talks with French officials as part of efforts to defuse tensions between Iran and the United States. The minister says Iran's revolutionary guards don't want to negotiate. He also said Yemen's government and southern separatists must end their differences to counter Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. Al Jubair said Riyadh is facilitating talks between two sides. In Britain, police say the 39 people found dead in a lorry container in Essex were Chinese nationals. They're still questioning the 25 year old lorry driver on suspicion of murdering eight women and 31 men. Police initially suggested the lorry could be from Bulgaria, but later said it entered the United Kingdom from Belgium. The Chinese embassy in London says it's in contact with the British police to confirm the reports. Well, we'll be back with more news from around the world right after this short break. Welcome back. Now, Russian and African states have created a mutual trading platform worth $5 billion at the Sochi summit. The Russian Export Center says the agreement will give Moscow access to the African market. Director Andrei Slepenyov said Russia will in turn open a trade corridor to the African continent. Moscow says the deal will boost cooperation with African states through new trade and investment. In Libya, three civilians have been killed and seven others injured in fresh airstrikes by Khalifa Haftar's forces near the capital, Tripoli. The Libyan government said the raids hit residential areas in the southern Al-Swani area. Earlier, two children were killed and three civilians injured in shelling close to the same neighborhood. In April, Haftar's forces launched a military campaign to capture Tripoli from the internationally recognized government. The United Nations has called Israel's 52-year hold on Palestine the longest belligerent occupation in the modern world. Briefing the General Assembly, UN Special Rapporteur in Palestine, Michael Link, said Israel is violating international law. He called for a decisive international intervention to end the grossly unequal balance of power in the region. Link said Israel's blockade of Gaza is denying of basic human rights and amounts to collective punishment. Meanwhile, Turkey's Foreign Minister Mevlet Cavusoglu asked the international community to stop Israel's sabotage of the two-state solution. The Israeli-Palestine peace process collapsed in 2014 due to Israel's continual refusal to end the occupation of the West Bank.
The United States government has said it supports Lebanese protesters' calls for economic reforms. A senior State Department official said people are rightfully angered with their government over corruption. The top U.S. official for the Middle East, David Schenker, has offered Washington's assistance to the Lebanese government for bringing reforms. Lebanon has been swept by anti-government protests which have paralyzed the country for a week. Protesters say they're challenging a system that fuels inequality, nepotism and corruption. President-elect of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen says the bloc is likely to extend the UK's Brexit deadline. During a visit to Helsinki, the new EU chief said now Britain should put forward a candidate for the European Commission. On Wednesday, EU member states backed a plan to postpone Brexit beyond 31st of October. The EU's backing comes after British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was compelled to send an extension request under a law passed by rebel MPs. The new EU chief said a further delay would mean the UK should put forward a nominee to join the incoming cabinet of EU commissioners. Indeed, if after the 1st of November, and there are steps to do, uh, so this uh, is not a given, uh, there might be an extension and there might be, uh, and the UK is still in the European Union, then of course uh, I would ask the UK to send a commissioner. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said Germany will not propose any EU proposal to grant Britain a Brexit extension beyond its deadline. Merkel and the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson discussed the future of the UK's bid for Brexit. Johnson said he is opposed to any further delay beyond the 31st of October. He said he holds a majority in the parliament for his Brexit deal. Bolivia's president Evo Morales has claimed an outright victory in the presidential elections. Official count shows Morales ahead of his opponent by 10 points, ruling out the possibility of a second round runoff vote. With over 98% of votes counted, Morales has secured 47% of the vote. The Organization of American States monitored the votes and the EU have called for a second round citing serious discrepancies in the electoral process. Delays in the count following Sunday's election fuel skepticism that Morales influenced the results. Following the delay, a sudden shift in Morales' favor fanned violent protests across the country. Morales has called the protest a coup attempt against him by the opposition. In Bangladesh, 16 people have been sentenced to death for the murder of a teenage girl who refused to withdraw a complaint of sexual harassment. The principal of a religious school was among those given capital punishment. The killers set their victim on fire on the roof of her school in April in the southeastern district of Feni. Police said the murder was carried out on the principal's order. The defense lawyer said his clients will challenge the verdict in the high court. The death sparked public outrage and mass demonstrations calling for the killers to be punished. Indonesian investigators have blamed a mechanical flaw for the 2018 Lion Air crash in October 2018. The flight crashed into the sea, killing all 1089 people on board. Family members of the victims said they are not satisfied with the probe. We are not satisfied with the report that was released to us today. We still feel that it didn't provide us with the information that we have been looking for. Now, a Russian woman accused of being a spy in the United States is finally being released by Washington after a three-year trial. Maria Butina is the only Russian citizen ever to have been convicted in the United States. Her lawyer, Robert Driscoll, says Butina will return to Russia on Friday. Butina said she was on a quest to establish better relations between Russia and the US. She was arrested in July 2018 on espionage allegations. In December, Butina entered a plea deal on a charge that she acted as an illegal, unregistered foreign agent. 
Well, from Russia with love. Now, in the U.S., Democrat leaders of the House Committee say the State Department has refused to share documents in an impeachment probe. The committee's earlier issued a subpoena for the documents in the probe against President Donald Trump. In a letter to Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan, the leaders said the refusal amounts to obstruction of the functions of Congress. They said the committees have gathered evidence about the relevance of the documents to the allegations against Trump. The president is facing allegations of abusing power for political benefit. The Democrats said the documents include memos on efforts to intimidate employees and Trump's request to Ukraine for political investigations. Countries around the world are observing the 74th United Nations Day, reminding the cause behind the peacekeeping organization. Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez promised to strive for human rights. In a message, Gutierrez said the organization will continue focusing on people's real problems at the time of global armed conflicts and climate change. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan reminded the UN Security Council to fulfill its commitments towards the issue of Indian-occupied Kashmir. He said Pakistan is an ardent supporter of the United Nations and will always stand with it for the common cause of world peace. Now, Pakistan has jumped up 28 places on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. The international financial body released its world index today. World Bank Country Director Ilango Pachamatu said Islamabad's recent reforms have led to the achievement. He said the improvement has been observed at the federal and provincial levels. He said Islamabad also jumped around 10 points on the international best practices parameter. On his recent visits, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan met a delegation of foreign investors. PM Khan invited them to make the best use of the opportunities in Pakistan under the vision of shared growth. Now, Pakistan is one of three countries in the world where polio is still endemic. The other two are Afghanistan and Nigeria. But some good news, Pakistan is geared up to go polio free this year thanks to an immunization campaign and support from international partners. More in this report from Samira Khan. Pakistan has come a long way in efforts to eradicate polio. In early 90s, the annual incidence of polio was estimated at more than 20,000 cases a year. Sensing the gravity of the situation, the government launched a nationwide polio eradication program in 1994. Over the last five years, the number of cases has declined from 306 in 2014 to 62 reported this year so far. In 2013, the World Health Organization imposed strict travel restrictions on Pakistan due to a short-term increase in the number of polio infections in the country. With the number of infections rapidly falling, Pakistan hopes to get the restrictions lifted soon. Pakistan has established a state-of-the-art laboratory at the National Institute of Health in Islamabad to strengthen surveillance of the polio virus. You are standing in the WHO Region Reference Laboratory, which is a part of the Global Polio Lab Network, and it is a WHO accredited laboratory. And if we talk about the polio eradication program in Pakistan, uh, it is considered to be the one of the best uh, program in the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. The polio virus targets children under the age of five and is usually spread via infected water. There is no specific treatment or cure, but several vaccines exist. Reporting for Indus News, Sumaira Khan, Islamabad. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he's open to scaling back plans for its digital currency Libra if it doesn't win approval. Zuckerberg made the comments at a U.S. congressional hearing over the planned cryptocurrency he is seeking to roll out next year. He said Libra's goal is to build a global payment system rather than a currency. Congresswoman Maxine Waters said Facebook should be addressing existing deficiencies before proceeding with the project. But Republican Representative Patrick McHenry said the plan should be given the benefit of the doubt.
Now, in other news, as migrants in Bosnia are waiting to be relocated as temperatures drop, hundreds of migrants are bracing for the winter. More in this report. In Bosnia, a tent city builds on a former garbage landfill, hosts hundreds of migrants. There is no water for the inhabitants and the area is surrounded by woods. Four kilometers, water problem. To survive, residents must carry plastic bottles to a nearby village and ask locals for water. But the migrants' growing numbers is frustrating the settlers. Jungle camp, no good. Mm. Problem. Okay. Water, no. Okay. Fruit, no. Okay. Money, no. Uh, city, city, go. Police problem. Uh, uh, go, Croatia. Slovenia problem. Lack of food, water, and medicines is making the situation worse. I'm not uh, uh, animal. I'm human. Cameraman, uh, I'm here in last uh, the three months. Cameraman coming, uh, uh, human rights coming, but uh, no, no, not uh, oh, no, okay, no response. Why? Bosnian authorities say they want to move the camp before winter hits, but have been unable to agree on a new location. Here the situation must become absurd so that we can finally start to solve it, so that everyone can start doing their job. The UN also criticized the camp's location, calling it inappropriate and inadequate. While the Red Cross has criticized Bosnian authorities, for failing to provide medical facilities. It is good to bring water to collect garbage, but who will take care of the large number of migrants with scabies, tuberculosis and hepatitis? Scabies. The Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights denigrated the camp's deplorable conditions and warned that the situation will be worse in winter. The international community is pushing Bosnian authorities to relocate the camp which the migrants call a jungle. In Mexico, hundreds of clowns march through the Mexico City to mark the 24th annual International Clown Convention. The disturbing four-day festival aims at honing the craft of comedy and supporting the clown industry. If you don't like clowns, don't watch this next report. Singing and dancing in Mexican streets, crowds of happy clowns paraded to the delight of curious onlookers. Many perform tricks to amuse their viewers. Clowns are an integral part of Mexican culture and life. It's a blessing to be a clown. God created different people and my most important quality is to be a clown. According to the Latin American Clown Association, there are some 10,000 professional clowns registered in Mexico. Thousands pop up on traffic intersections to perform and earn a few pesos. It's a tough life for them, but the convention is part of an effort to maintain high standards of clowning. The festival arranges a series of workshops to help the clowns with the latest costumes, shoes, makeup and magic tricks. <laughs> We are marking 24 years of this fair of laughter. That is wonderful and it's great more colleagues were able to come to have fun with us, to train ourselves better so that there will be more work. During four days, around 450 clowns from 14 countries will attend the festival to spread happiness, laughter and smiles. Someone should tell those people to stop clowning around. Well, we'll be back with more serious news right after this short break. Welcome back. Now in business news, European stock markets have edged higher after the upbeat earnings by German automotive company Daimler. The pan-European stock 600 index has climbed marginally. London's FTSE 100 index has also gained 0.2%. The indices of both Frankfurt's DAX 30 and Paris's CAC 40 have ascended 0.5% each. 
With the markets entering the third quarter earnings season, Finland's Nokia shares have plunged 21%. U.S. electric car maker Tesla has surprised investors with a quarterly record revenue of 6.3 billion U.S. dollars. This has shot up the company's shares to more than 20%. Tesla achieved the feat after rebounding from a rocky start to the year with a loss of $1.1 billion. After the soaring shares, chief executive Elon Musk has promised a rollout of cheaper SUVs next year. He said improvements to smart summons feature are also expected in the coming year. The company has attributed the turnaround to cost control efforts. Well, it's 23 degrees here in Lahore, but let's take a look at the weather around the world. Well, that's all from me and the team here in Lahore, but we'll be back at the top of the hour with the headlines. For all the latest updates and all of our stories, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Thank you for watching and bye-bye.